Hi, I'm David Reckow with Haggerty, and I'm the dirty hands behind all the Redline rebuilds. I'm Ben Woodworth, also with Haggerty, and uh, I'm the guy behind the camera for all these. And um, yeah, we're here today to dissect and go through our Ford 289 Redline rebuild. Here we go. All right. Look at that clean shop floor, huh? The shop. So what do we have here? Sweet. So here we have a 1964 by casting number uh, Fairlane 289 Ford engine. Um, it has, it, if you're a Chevy guy, it looks like it's all built backwards because the oil pan, uh, the pickup is in the front of the motor instead of the back. Uh, of course, the exhaust manifolds are on correctly going out the back, but the distributor hangs out the front. But for all intents and purposes, this is original motor. It came out of a, a garage that had been sitting for quite a while. It's actually not too horrible on the outside, um, but it's definitely been leaking some oil and, and, and has some time on it. So it's, it's ready for some freshening. So just some details here. It's grimy, it's rusty. Yeah. Okay, so getting started here. Ooh, shiny new engine stand. Yeah, we got blessed with a brand new uh, engine stand. Okay, so breakdown is typically pretty straightforward. I mean, you're just unbolting everything. Yep, basically just unbolt everything, start at the top down, and um, you know, pull the tin work out of the way, and, and so on and so forth. Well, is there anything you're looking for as you break down the stuff? I mean, you, you, we basically know we're doing, obviously we're going into this knowing we're doing a full tear down, but like right. what stuff are you making note of? Well, I mean, for instance, if you were gonna be reusing the the valve covers, you know, I'll be looking for rust holes in them, that type of thing. Those are actually in, in excellent uh, condition, being brand new, and, or not, being new old stock on there. Um, and then you're, and then after that, you know, I'd be looking at the exhaust, or the intake manifold, making sure that there's no cracks, no huge warps in it. Uh, look at the threads, see, you know, inspect them as far as being stripped out. And then once you get that off, you start to really see the, the tail of how this was cared for. Um, that nasty sludge buildup that's in there is, in my mind, uh, a lot of heat cycles and a lot of no oil changes. Uh, so the oil ran a little longer than it should and the motor was warm quite a few times, I would say. Um, doesn't appear to have like an issue like with a head gasket because then that oil would be more of a, uh, uh, I call it a coffee color because mm -hmm. I like cream in my coffee, but it's, <laughs> it's, uh, it would be real brown and frothy. And that would be from the coolant getting into. That would be from into. the coolant mixing in, yeah. yeah. At this point, when you're tearing it down, there's nothing catastrophic about it. You're not thinking about like, oh man, no. you know, this thing threw a rod or right. anything like that. This but is I, just like an to... engine out of a wrecked car that's yeah. been sitting for 30 years. Yes, but as I go through it, I like to put together a list of all the pieces I'm gonna, I'm gonna change or need new. You know, like a new crank bolt, like a new, water pump, um, you know, you name it, fresh, fresh, uh, oh. rocker studs. Oh. Yeah. That's like I said, very ugly. Yeah, that yeah. is, I mean, even when we took it to Thoroughby to have them clean it, like it was, <laughs> yeah. they were at it for a while with the scraper yeah, yeah. and yeah, they like to scrape stuff off before they fill their, their parts cleaner full of the, of the gook, get the big stuff off. <laughs> yep. Which I don't, I don't blame them for that. So we knew going into this, this was going to be an upgraded engine. What did we know? I mean, what the whole point of this kind of walk well, me through. Yeah, so what we knew is this was just the run of the mill, 289, two barrel, cast iron intake, very, you know, the low power version of that. I don't want to call it mundane because it's still a V8. It's still snappy. Um, but we wanted to go with more of a build to the, to the Cobra um, Cobra Shelby type spec, you know, a little the, the next upgrade, um, which would take this from what ballpark about 260 horse roughly up to in the 310s, 310 zone. So there are, I mean, this this is Ford's version of the of the like the Chevy small, the 350 yeah, small block. Yep, this is Ford's small block, um, 289 cubic inches. It's actually the same. It's a four inch. Um, a four inch bore, and in that four inch bore, that's bit, it's the same as a 350 at that point. It just has a shorter stroke, so it likes to rev quicker, okay. which, is a, which is a benefit in certain aspects. With this being a 289, mm -hmm. 
I mean, it was it went into a lot of cars in this in the mid '60s. Yes, yeah, it went into everything. I mean, the big pieces it would go into would be a Fairlane, you know, as a for instance. Of course, it was in the Mercury's as well, Mercury versions. Um, but you did have the Ford Falcons that got the upgrade. You had in your especially your lightweight packages, and then and then the onset was into the into the Mustangs. So this particular motor is what they refer to as the early or the five volt uh, engine. It takes a it only has literally five volts across the back with the bell housing attached to it for the transmission. In '65 they changed it to six volt. I'm assuming they realized that it wasn't quite strong enough. They were having some issues. In doing that though, the package also got a little bit wider on the back side of it as far as the transmission. So this this smaller narrower package you know fits nicely in some of the the littler cars. Okay. Um, and then also keep in mind that, that you know Ford from an overall packaging standpoint this this motor is, is quite narrow and part of the reason it was able to go into such versatility of cars is your your Falcons and your Mustangs were all shock tower cars and when you do the shock towers that engine bay gets really narrow. Um, the hoods might be just as big as anything else but the shock tower in the package area is, is really narrow. So it really limited it, but this motor is narrow, so it helped, you know, fit that V8 into those those cars. So even with the performance upgrades, you're still at a narrow yes. width. So yep. so you can you can do those upgrades without having to worry about making room under Correct. the hood. Yep. Continuing on with the disassembly, walk me through kind of. Yep. So here, just take basic took off the exhaust manifold and, and then take all the head bolts out. Um, there's been some discussion relative to none of the head bolts come out, they all break. Well, <laughs> I, I honestly have not had that issue, but I could certainly see where it could be a problem. Um, but that would be with any engine, it wouldn't be specific to, to this particular one. Um, and you can see it is grimy. In fact, it is really interesting, <laughs> there was actually a little chunk of nail and a piece of wood in the intake uh, area, <laughs> so I'm not sure how that got there. <laughs> Interesting. Um, and it is so grimy. The reason I'm, um, I have a pair of uh, pliers uh, that will grab on the inside. And, um, and what I'm doing here is I actually have to pull those lifters out and ultimately tap them out of the holes because there's so much varnish buildup. Because you're, the, the block has a casting you know, piece that let's call it an inch of, of a bore. Mm -hmm. Well, the lifter hangs on the top side and on the bottom side. Well, it hangs more to the bottom, and what will happen is you'll get varnish built up from the oil on the bottom side, but they have to come out that way. Well, you have to get it past that. So you get a break off gunk, if you will, to, okay. get, it, to get it out. So it's just flat out a dirty engine. Um, that's, that's what happens. And you're not reusing these lifters? No. No, these are, we're going to replace the hydraulic camshaft with a, with a solid lifter camshaft for that bump in, in horsepower. Off comes the oil pan. Anything under here that you were no, I didn't see worried about? No, it's surprising here. I mean, when you start getting into this area, you, as you're pulling the rods off, you're looking at the at the rod bearings. Not so much that you're going to reuse them by any means, but you're you're looking at to see what kind of wear they're in. They were pretty well wore, but thankfully we we caught this motor to some extent before it started damaging the crank, meaning you had to really cut it. You know, make some big cuts to it because as those bearings wear, they start to hammer on the on the steel part of the crankshaft, uh, the bearings are the wear item. The crankshaft should not be. And likewise with the rod end. So, so you know, you want you want to you want to maintain that engine before that bearing starts to get so bad, and um, and there's no grooves wore or none of that. So we were actually able to, as we'll see, able to get away with another uh, just a polish you know, to things. So this this one spun, unlike our Hemi, which was locked up to the last piston. Yeah. Yep. You didn't have any problems getting these pistons out? No, this one, yeah, this one spun fairly well, <laughs> but we did have to knock on that last little ridge. Oh, okay. Because it had a ridge of carbon, um, not so much uh, wear in the, in the bore, but, but carbon. So, yeah, we had to knock these out. You can't... Uh, <laughs> Obviously not <laughs> reusing the uh, no. <laughs> pistons, otherwise no. they wouldn't be treated, so... No, exactly. <laughs> to a drop onto the floor. Uh, and, and with any engine disassembly, make sure that those... It is very specific when you put the main caps back in. Likewise with the rods, as far as the caps for them. But the rods have to go back in the same hole, 
and the caps have to go back on the same rod, obviously, but then the, the caps also have to go in the same spot in the mains and face the same direction. Okay. So you want to make sure before you pull them off that they're marked in some fashion that you can repeat the assembly. Um, so specifically, um, I forget on this one if, if it had an arrow, but lots of times they'll have an arrow or a dot or something that says forward okay. or less. And then these are actually cast in, you know, one, two, three, four. They usually don't label the main. It will only go on one way. Right. And then as far as all the rods go, you usually use a tap. Yep, um, and I got a number, a number punch, cheap little number punch that you use, just to tap them one through eight. All right, out goes the crankshaft, out goes the camshaft, and that's not being reused, right? Because we're yep. going to a more yep. aggressive cam. And that's the first camshaft. Even the Hemi, I didn't have to, but that's the first camshaft I had to physically beat out of the block <laughs> because, the, again, the the grime on the block or on the cam was so bad that it did not want to slip through. It would rotate. It would mm -hmm. rotate all day long, but it would not come out of the... Just those little build-up ridges yeah, yep. of things. Exactly. All right, so here we go. You had messed with them trying to pull them out, but yeah. they weren't coming, so... Yeah, so just push them back in the hole <laughs> and, and drop them off the bottom. Nice. All right, down to the block. Yeah. So block is done. Now we're on to the heads and just baking. Basically, I'm using a hammer there to tap the, the keepers out of the retainers. They tend to seat themselves anyway. And you can see that obviously they're equally as grimy and grungy as uh, the rest of the motor. I'd say not quite as messy as the Hemi, but still yeah, yeah. pretty grimy. Yeah. I love seeing all the parts on the on yeah. the back all just like lined up. Yep. Yeah. This sort of thing where you really get to see what all goes into. Yeah, when you spread the motor out, it's amazing how much space it takes. Uh huh. And it's it's very gratifying when you put it back together and you regain all that space. <laughs> <laughs> A whole table's worth oh, of parts. Man, yes. All right, to Thoroughby we go once again. And here's what we were talking about. They're scraping the heck out of this thing before they put it in their parts yeah. washer so they don't end up with, yeah, I mean, you can yeah, see. You can see the pile down. All the, this down yeah. here, just yeah. amazing yeah. amounts of yeah. gunk um, coming off there. I would not want that job. No. No, Dave, Dave can have that one. <laughs> Lots of old gaskets to scrape off. Yeah, and we didn't help him any either. We, we let him <laughs> take all that out. Yep. So there was a question, and I, I answered it in the comment, but um, what these three big green bins are, which the, the shot happens fast, and you don't yeah. really kind of see what's going on. Yeah, so the very first one you can see has a huge chimney coming out of it. That's the, that's the fire and brimstone area. Um, that's just what heating just bake the daylights out of it so you're just baking it to try and cr like yep. get everything off it's it's the same principle as clean, a self-cleaning oven okay uh, I mean you just you just heat the daylights out of it and that stuff burns burns off okay um, for the most part it's all oil so it burn you know it burns off pretty pretty well it turns the turns charcoal so, so the second one you go through it and it it actually bead blasts the whole uh, assembly it's a shot almost a shot peen function and then the last one is just a pure pure tumble and cool down cool down blow blows air across it and tries to get out all the shot blast and, and what's left of the residue yeah all right so he pulls it out and then the big the big check is yep this is this is the first go no go if you will for the for the block reuse uh, you're looking he's doing a Magnaflux function where you use this magnet and, and this powder they sp spray to it. If there's a crack, it will collect in the crack and, and almost like stand up, if you will, and mm. highlight where the crack's yeah, at. In, it, the uh, crack affects the magnetic field. Exactly, so. yep. So then so. That, uh, that indicates if you got a, and lifter valleys are, are the first most prone area for a, for a crack to be at. And it's not to say that if you have a crack in a block in this area that the block is junk. It just means you got different work for you. Mm -hmm. um, lots of times they can be repaired. They have a there's a stitching process of uh, overlapping screws for the most part that uh, that'll fix those. Cool. So we but we passed that test. No yep. no cracks. All good to go. And yep. then on to the boring bar. 
So there were some questions of people were like, I guess maybe they missed this shot, I don't know, but people were like, why would you hone it without boring it first? And that was, I mean, we did bore it. Uh, yeah, we bored it first and then, and then hone it. Yeah, the only, the only reason you would hone without a bore is if the, if the, if the diameter of the hole is such that you can clean it up with a bore or a hone. I mean, okay. if you can just clean it up, put new, you know, let's say it's, let's say it's still the size and it's still round and you're just, you're just literally re-ringing a motor. You can freshen up that crosshatch with just a pure. For oil retention. For, yes, for compre yeah, for your, more your uh, sealing of the rings. Oh, okay. So you can, you can put a fresh crosshatch in it and a fresh set of rings and clean an engine up that way opposed to if you okay. don't need to, but as soon as you're out of size, you got, you have to bore. And it never makes sense to, and you know, I guess there's maybe some circumstances where it would make sense to bore one hole versus all of them. But And when you say out of size, you mean out of circle or out of just the size where a piston and a ring is available? Uh, both. So you would have, well, first off, if you, you want to, you have to keep a certain clearance between the piston diameter and the wall of the cylinders. So they're, they're never dead on because your piston's going to grow. So you don't want it, you know, you want that hole to be so, so big or X amount of clearance in there. But at the same token, you don't want it too big to where the, the piston actual rock in the hole, it will destroy itself. It'll knock the skirts off. Right? Okay. And then, and then you have nothing, quite honestly. <laughs> um, and that is done just, you're just measuring it. Yes. Yep. So you go through, you mic the bores, um, you check them for roundness as well and taper. Taper is really the biggest wear function. Um, they'll change top to bottom. Mm. So in typically speaking, pistons are with the exception of, you know, having custom pistons made, um, you know, off the shelf pistons are typical size of standard, uh, 30 over 40 over and 60 over. That's a, just a very general statement. And, um, and then associated rings with them as well. So do you remember what we bored this to? This is 30, 30 thousandths over. Now, is the order in which you do all this important? Yeah, because when you're dealing with the block. Yeah, because you want to make sure. Again, you're kind of going. There's there's two ways that you're you're looking at this. You're looking at that constant. Is this block usable? Mm -hmm. Right. So let's say you had one cylinder, or all the cylinders were were so wore that you would have to sleeve them. There's a point where it doesn't make sense to sleeve all eight cylinders. Unless, of course, there's some huge value relative to the block. It's something's rare. Rare, um, or it matches, the numbers yeah. match yep. your chassis, yep. the, all that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. Um, but yes, you would bore them first and then deck the surface. Everything's relative to the crank center line um, as far as how it's machined. And decking is simply you're making it flat again, so yep. it creates a good seal with the gasket and the heads. Yeah, exactly, yep. All right, on to the hone, and that's essentially polishing and putting the yeah. um, crosshatch pattern in. Yeah, and it, that honing process is your final, so you rough cut them on the boring bar. It's very um, repeatable and, and tolerance is fantastic, but this is really your fly, fly hair that you're, you're working out with the hone, and you're putting that crosshatch in there. To, to create the good seal with the rings. So there you go, he's checking it with the yep. micrometer there. Yep, block is all ready. Onto the heads. Now these heads needed a decent amount of work. Part of it was voluntary, I guess, and part yes. of it was necessary. Yeah, well, yeah, part of it is, yeah, all the above. <laughs> so going with a, a slightly higher, well, a fairly more aggressive cam, um, you start to stress the production pressed in studs. So from Ford, and a lot of the manufacturers did the same thing, they use what they call press-in studs. So you have that cast iron boss, they're drilled to a certain size, there's X amount of press fit between the cast iron and the steel stud. As you start to increase that lift, it puts more force trying to suck that stud out. And as you change that, obviously you're not gonna be opening up the valve and you're gonna be losing performance and ultimately you're gonna have parts laying in the bottom of the pan. <laughs> Um, so we went through and pulled those studs out. Um, he's got a hydraulic uh, press, for lack of a better word, that draws them out and then goes through and drills and taps them. So this is then being tapped 
Yep. And then those studs will be put in later in the assembly yep. process. Yep. So it flips the head around, and then what are we doing? What are we seeing here? So here he's, he's taking the valves out because we, yeah, we put hardened seats in this. And the point of hardened seats is what? As opposed to, normally are the seats just the, the cast iron is the same material or they're, or they're yeah, actual? Yep, yeah, in normal, in, in this vintage of an engine, um, these were all designed to work with lead, lead gasoline. Okay. Um, today's gasoline is all 100% lead free. Um, so it's tetraethyl, tetraethyl lean or something along that line. But at any rate, it, um, it was what was put in the gasoline at the time, actually as a lubricant, but then also it had properties for, for temperature. The, the newer, call it lead free gasoline, and I say newer, it's only been around for 50 years, <laughs> is, is, um, tends to burn really hot on the exhaust side. Okay. So hardened seats take more temperature and all the temperature tends to be concentrated all on the exhaust side opposed to on the intake. Okay. So, so when things, uh, you know, a, a big term is, yeah, I had hardened seats put in it, that typical is, typically is being referred to as the exhaust side. It's not to say you don't replace the intake seats because you certainly can if they're wore out. So both were replaced on this? Yes, they were. And was it, a, they were just worn? Yeah. And he figures since we're replacing them, you might as well put the hardened seats in? Yes, yep. And is, is there such thing as hard, hardened seats for intake or you only do it on the exhaust? Well, they're, yeah, for the, most, for the most part, it's just on the, on the, uh, on the exhaust. Because it's more of a pure heat yeah. Yep. function. And All then right. they get a you know, multi-angle valve job to them. And that's for flow and for sealing. Gotcha. And, and then, then, of course, surface the bottom of them so they match up nice to the, to the head. So back over to Mike. And Mike's doing what over there in that little red press? So Mike, in this little red press, he's putting new uh, um, rod bolts in. Okay. The, the majority of your rod failures are the rod bolts themselves. They stretch, fatigue. The end cap comes off and the piston starts to go all willy-nilly with <laughs> everything else. Getting slapped around by yeah, the yeah. crankshaft and everything else. Yeah. Um, so these, these rods got new bearings, um, new bolts. Yeah, you get new, bushing, new bushings new bushings in the small end okay. yeah, at, the, at the piston side, the mm -hmm. small end. So he got new bushings there. He cleans them up as well. He also, in this shot here, he's resurfacing the, the call it the width of the rod. So that way, as they... Where they mate, where the... Yeah, where they go together, you get enough, enough uh, clearance, rod clearance. So because you're taking material off then, you're basically changing it into an oval. Well, this is on the surfaces. Right, but if you, if you take a, the middle out of a circle... Yes. You're turning it maybe not oval, but like right. football shaped almost, yep. Yep. which brings you to right. So he so he cleaned up both surfaces because of the so he cleaned up the um, call it the, the the perpendicular surface to the bolts, mm -hmm. and then he also cleaned up the parallel surface to the bolts. Okay. So he cleaned up side clearance and mating surface of the cap and the mm -hmm. rod, and and then that certainly necessitates chain or. Uh, resizing that big end and you're sizing that when he sizes that he knows what bearings are going in there so then yeah, he sizes it yeah, to the size it back to spec yep. Um, yep. and the bearings have both an ID and an OD so they fit in there but also then fit to the crankshaft correct yep. cool so he's got his little measuring tool up yep. there so this is basically a home just like is being used for the block on itself, same, same principle. And then you have a, a, a three-pronged gauge that he's setting them on to, to measure. And it's, at the end of the day, it's truly, it's really a comparator mm -hmm. more than it is anything else. So he sets it up to the, to the nominal size and then from a comparator function, it's X amount over or X amount under. Okay. All right, nearing the end of the... Yep, now we're, now we're in the, what, up in that upper right is actually, it's a little heating element. So what you do is these are, we're using these as a, pistons can be assembled in two ways. They're either press fit or they're, um, they refer to as pin fit, pin fit. And 
PinFit allows you to push them on by hand and then use E-clips or clips to, to hold the, the, the wrist pin relative to the piston. And that's what the Volkswagen was, were just and that's the little exactly, clips. Yep, the Volkswagen, the Harley, uh, the Hemi. Okay. We did those all that way. They call them a floating wrist pin. And then, and then you have press fit where the pin is literally press fit into the, the, the small end of the rod. So you can see him setting up right here. Yep. Yep. So as you warm up that small end of the rod, the hole gets larger by nature of <laughs> expansion, and, expansion contraction. and contraction. Exactly. And literally that pin just slides right in. And as soon as that cools, it's in there. It would take a press to push it back out. But you don't press them in because you always risk a concern of not getting them in square and you, it's easier just to heat them up and do this. I mean, it's not to say it can't be done, but. It seems like it goes a lot. I mean, he, he, when, we, when I set up the shot, yeah. it all happened a lot faster than, oh, I, yeah, yeah. than I thought it was going yeah. to. Fact, I mean, as soon as he put hand, it in there, it, it yeah, pushed right in. Yeah, he uses like a little hand push. To just push them in, you can see it laying there on the table. Oh yeah. Okay, so he's just so using he's his hand. He's to... taking that rod, setting it in there, and going whoop, and it's as easy as that. And by the time it gets over here to the plastic rack, you wouldn't be able to push it back out That's with crazy. a hammer. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So this is just quick polish, right? There was nothing really that needed to be done with them. No, yep. We went through. Uh, Mark went through and, and measured everything. Everything was to size or within that, you know, within the specifications. And then just did a quick polish on it to take off any any roughness in that fashion. All right, and almost back to the assembly process. Yeah, so we got a beautifully clean block. Some people like to paint after they assemble. I prefer to paint before we assemble because that's the cleanest that block's going to be. And um, to me, as long as I take my time and, and I'm careful, I, I don't end up with a. I still end up with a good piece. It's kind of like. <laughs> painting the wall and then putting the trim on or putting the trim on and taping off the trim to paint the wall. And right. that's the, the, there's two blues in, in the Ford world. There's a lighter blue and then the darker blue. And uh, obviously we went with the darker blue on this one. Looks good. Yeah. It even matches uh, the Travers there. The yeah. Banner. It's, it's <laughs> slick. And we, and we prime them, you know, we prime them with yeah, uh, you can epoxy see the... primer there be, to begin with. And then this is automotive. This happens to be a single stage instead of a two stage with a clear coat. So we just, we opted for a, a single stage. It's got a lot of gloss to it. It looks really good. It holds up very well. Um, you know, we've said before, you, there's a place for... There's a place for rattle cans. Selling, the... Yeah, selling rattle can, engine paint. Yeah. In that, but if you if you can do, even if you had to shoot this outside, you know, with some paint, it would it, it'll hold up better in the long run. Yeah. Back in the shop. Yep. All right. So first step. Uh, first step after everything's cleaned up is uh, and start putting in freeze plugs. Um, they fill up the holes relative to the the, the casting process into the um, into the water jacket, and they do serve a second purpose as. If you happen to have water, the idea is that those plugs would pop out if it froze. Um, I would not rely on that. I wouldn't store a motor with water in it because I've seen plenty of them crack below that water. Still Plus. plenty of places for water to get yeah, frozen trapped. and expanded and it's amazing, do bad things. Uh, yeah, It's amazing <laughs> the power of uh, hydraulics. All right, so it looks like you're putting something in where the camshaft... Yeah, so here we're putting in camshaft bearings. Um, they're very specific on, on where the hole is at relative to the hole. The hole in the cam bearing is very specific to the hole in the block. You want to have them line up otherwise you'd plug your oil feed. Mm -hmm. So your cam would not get oil and that wouldn't work very well. And then as quickly as we put it on, we've got yeah, to pull it off. Take it off. <laughs> and the reason for that is you can put, you need to put half in from one side and half in from the other side. In hindsight, I could have stuck them all in first and then put the freeze plugs in later. Um, Maybe next time. Maybe next time. And then, uh, and then Sometimes, especially with this sort of thing, when we get started with a video shot, once yeah. the stuff's in, like you can't go back and. No, exactly. <laughs> I mean, there's some stuff like some if stuff we had to, you can. Yeah. But when you're ha hammering stuff in. Yep, exactly. It's a little different. Yeah. So you got a couple little threaded plugs there. Yeah, there's threaded plugs in the back, and mainly because they go directly to the outside world. Um, okay. 
leak path wise. I put some um, just some Teflon, liquid Teflon on them to seal them up real good. And um, and then on all the freeze plugs and in this cam plug as well, I always use the um, uh, high tack it's called, and it's just a, a sealer that, but it's not a RTV sealer. It's it's more of a form of gasket function. Okay. So first uh, first part of the performance upgrade being yep. installed. First part is this um, flat tappet camshaft, but on a solid lifter. And what that allows is the solid lifters over the hydraulics uh, perform better in general terms because you can, they're a little more efficient because you, with hydraulics, you're relying on oil pressure to keep that lifter solid. But it also is quieter. So, because you do not have any uh, mechanical lash or gap. Mm -hmm. So, in a solid lifter camshaft, you have to set up a gap in there so it has room for um, expansion again relative to heat. Um, but in doing that, you can get a little aggressive, more aggressive cam lobe because you know exactly where it's going to be at, if, if you will. That's crazy to me that things, as like when you're, they're in your hand, that are as solid as steel oh yeah that that it changes that it oh, that it changes it's yeah. and that not only that but we know that and then it is engineered to do to, it to do it and yes. to be managed in the whole process yep. of yep. to not only work when it's cold mm -hmm. but then also to work when it's heated yes. up is i don't know that stuff always is cool to right. me so I'm sure everybody noticed that I use two different kind of lubrication. I have in standard molybdenum, oh, I never can say that right, <laughs> uh, uh, white grease, if you will. And I use that on usually on all the rod, on all the bearing types functions. But on the camshaft, I like to use that red um, camshaft lube that comes with them. Gotcha. Um, it tends to stick a little better. In, in the camshaft, if you think about it, it's hanging out midair. In, you don't want all the lubricant to drip off of it. Right. And with the molybdenum, it, it has, it's not as uh, sticky, <laughs> so it does tend to drip off. But of course, when it's trapped by a bearing, it's not dripping off. It's, right. it's stuck there. So <laughs> It's and being it's, held in place. And it has some economic benefit to it. Okay, so this is, this is, every time you do this for all these, it always confuses me. It's like, well, you haven't put the crankshaft in yet. What do you put? <laughs> hey, you forgot tighten something. Tighten <laughs> everything down for. But walk yes. me through why why right. you do that. What's so so one of the, the the key areas I would say is the first error of any assembly. Okay, is again we've talked about the engineering side standpoint of why there's clearances. They are important mm -hmm. and they're designed to do certain things. So in this case, you have your multi-layer bearing and a, in steel trapped around it. Well, the bearing is, is the bearing surface. I mean, it has its function relative to a bearing, but it doesn't work at all without lubrication. So if the bearing was, let's say, the exact same size as the steel part that was going inside of it, it would still gall up and freeze. It would mm. not do its function. You have to have a thin layer of oil in there to act as its lubrication. Um, so, so what I'm doing here is I'm going, and the only way to measure this, the best way to measure this, mm -hmm. is to physically know what that size is. So what I'm doing here is I'm taking the, the two half shell bearings, trapping them inside of the the cap and the block, just like it's going to be assembled, mm -hmm. I am torquing them exactly the way they're going to be torqued down because that takes any deflection or anything funny out of mm -hmm. this is This is how it will be. And then I'm going through and, and using a, a comparator again, but it's, it's set up based on a mic. So there's a value for the, for the bore, and then I'm comparing that so in a plus or minus fashion. The previous to this, you see in the background, you were... Yeah, mic yeah. the crankshaft up. Right. Gotcha. So right there, I'm measuring, happen to be measuring rods, but I do the rods and the mains, they're the same same principle. Mm -hmm. So you get a nominal value there you of, go, of what the size is on the... Right there, on you're those. on the... So let's just argument sake, this isn't the number, but let's say it's, they are two inches on the, on the, on the number. Well then, when I go and I put the bearings in the caps, and I measure that, I want to see 
two thousandths, I want to see that hole to be two thousandths larger than the rod, as an example. So you're oh, giving that thousand. two thousand slears for the oil yes. to be yep. and to keep it lubricated right. and and for a, for a good rule of thumb, a piece of paper is three thousandths. So if you think that's pretty, it's pretty stinking thin, but it makes yeah. all the world a difference. Because if you get into the, in, in this motor actually, uh, spec wise, because I remember I'm always interested in what the factory specs were, mm -hmm. um, or maze maybe sometimes, is uh, the clearance for, the, for these rods were, or mains were roughly, I think it was, it was 0 0.0009. So just a shade under a thousand, which is really tight. <laughs> yeah. But then up to three and a half. Oh, okay. So you had so all kinds had of room. Pretty, to... Yeah, pretty good room. But <laughs> there's a where you want to be at, you know, relative to the spec too. So you, mm. I tend to, depending you... on what the motor's being used for, I'll, I'll stick to one side versus another. So okay. in a in a street application, I tend to stick a little tighter because it's going to see a lot more mileage, that type of stuff. Mm -hmm. And then on a race motor, you tend to stick a little bit higher, a little looser. It's faster, <laughs> that type of thing. Less, it's faster drag. meaning less friction? <laughs> yes, <Okay>. exactly. <laughs> exactly. Less things getting in the way of getting that power to right. your wheels. Yep, yep. All right, so getting some more goop on there. Yep, yep. that's more of that Molly Lube. And of course, the main cap has a seal because it's external. Up here, you don't have a seal. That's the only seal on the crankshaft is on the very, the rear main seal, mm -hmm. which is the token. I got a drop in the middle of my motor on my garage floor. Where is it from? Mm -hmm. Main seal. <laughs> Virtually every time. <laughs> Unless, of course, the valve covers are peeing all over. All right. All right. Okay. All right. So now here, I'm doing the, the same principle as on the main caps. So I take every one of the piston assemblies. Uh, put the bearing in, torque down the cap to the spec, uh, to the spec, and then compare the length right there. And the same idea. I'm looking same. for that clearance. So you, that that first shot where you were on the crankshaft, mm -hmm. those measurements, you're doing those both for the mains and for the rods. Yes. Yep. Now, anything special? Again, we we talked about the the camshaft being more aggressive. Uh, was there anything in regards to the pistons going in? Yeah, on the, the JE pistons were a, uh, what's considered a four, I think it was a four or five cc um, valve relief. So that technically is a recess in the piston. So instead of being dead flat across the top, you have a little extra. It's, okay, it's so you clearance. can see. Yeah, there you can see it. Yeah. Yep. Clearance for the intake and exhaust valves. And, but that, calculates into the compression side of things. So you could have, where the two happens to be on that piston, you could have actually a dome right there. So that dome would, if you remember on the, on the Hemi, we had mm -hmm. that big dome that went up into the chamber. You could do the same thing on these as well. And that dome could be, gosh, you could be pretty big. And you could also have a dish that could be up into like the 36 range, 36 cc, it was almost a quarter inch deep in mm -hmm. there. And that's to bring that compression down so what was the target compression ratio we were going for? Target compression ratio was, was nine and a half. Okay. And I ended up calculation rise at 9.46. Uh, close enough, I guess. So close enough. <laughs> That's right. Um, does that change, does the compression ratio now change what kind of fuel you have to put in it? Well, that's, what you're, that's why I skated towards the nine and a half. Originally, this motor would have been like 10.2. Okay. 10 and a half, somewhere in that, up in that range. In... The reason, I shouldn't say that particular motor was not, but the high performance version would have been in that range. And the fuel in the back in that era had more oomph to it. It had a higher octane rating. And now it's hard to, not hard to get, it's always easy to get 93, but 87 is certainly more economical. And so I've targeted that nine and a half so it at least gives you the zone of, I can pull up to the gas pump and get 87 to 93 all the time. Okay. So where it works out and where it likes, it'll, you know, we'll be able to get fuel for it without an issue. All right, so what are you doing here? You got uh, so, everything numbered. So yeah, was yeah. It, is it specific rings to specific, like why? Yeah, yeah everything's numbered because 
well, quite frankly, when you went home that night before, right. I stayed up until the wee hours of the night filing pistons, which is as entertaining as, I don't know, Yeah. it would make watching grass grow entertaining. There are, uh, that, was, that was not the only instance of, <laughs> of things that I went home and, and you know, put my kids to bed and slept and you were, right. you were up until 2 a.m. Yes. doing something extra because otherwise there's really no point in me being there for a shot that would last all of one or two oh, seconds yes. and would take you four or five hours. Yeah. So, so to get back to that, so basically what filing the rings means is, so you, you take, you take all of every ring, including the, with the exception of the, call it the corrugated ring, which is the oil control ring. You have, you really have four rings. You have an upper ring, um, a second, you know, t a top ring, a bottom ring in the compression area. And then you have an upper and lower oil control ring. And then you have the middle ring, if you will, in that oil control area, that's the corrugated deal. But at any rate, so what you do is you take the rings and you set them at a, you know, one inch down in the, in the bore that it's going into and then you use a feeler gauge and you check how much those in-gaps come around. Okay. So as an in-gap comes around, and for instance, in this one, it was, uh, it's, it's four thousandths for every inch, inch of bore. So 16 thousandths overall. Okay. That's what you want that gap to be at. In... The reason for the gap is again back to the heat scenario. That wrap, that gap is going to close up as it as it warms up, yep. and you do not want the ends to hit against each other because then they have to go this way, <laughs> and then they start to make a whole lot of ugly again. So it's a <laughs> it's a real fine. Uh, you know when they say an orchestra is very fine tuned. Mm -hmm. Well, there's an orchestra for you. I'll tell you because every engine has to have that balance. Otherwise, yep. any anything off, and it's not gonna it's not gonna last very long. It's not to say it won't last. It just, mm -hmm. it might not be. It's the fine tuning. It's, yeah, exactly. It's, exactly. It's, uh, and of course, rings in general as well, you have, like I mentioned, you have a top ring and a bottom ring. Mm -hmm. and you do not want to get them flip-flop because they may be different upper and lower. Okay. In uh, pretty much all the piston rings, if it's specific to that, you know, they'll have a dimple that not only which way the ring goes up or down, but then also relative to which groove it goes in, top okay. or bottom. Lots of stuff to keep track of. Yeah. In there, you know, these are a, 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 a molly ring. Again, so it's, you don't want to overspread them because you risk cracking them. That's why the tool is handy. You can put them in by hand, but then you start to get fingertips that look worse than mine. So. <laughs> All right, you can go to the pistons. All right, so pure and simple piston assembly. You can see I upgraded on our, on our tool here. So we have a, you know, nice little clamp deal here. It does work really nice. And of course, boil the daylights out everything, as you can see. Yep. Uh, and you're, I mean, ob obviously it's important to put them all in the right places. Are these, are these numbered differently than other engines we've <laughs> assembled before? Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny you should mention that, Ben. Um, yes, the, uh, it's seemingly every, there must have been like a weird engineering seminar where they all got together and brainstormed on how they could differently order, you know, the firing orders on right. stuff because yeah. everyone has their own idea. It seems like mm -hmm. so if you're if you're very hard grained in the direction that one company does when you go to the next company, you better check it about twelve times because you'll probably get it wrong eleven of those. And hopefully, the last time is the correct way. Yep. So yes. So for instance. In Ford uh, land here, the passenger side front is number one. And then they labeled them, and it's specifically to the firing order. So you have one, two, three, four. All on one the side. passenger side. Yep. Okay. And then you have five, six, seven, eight on the driver's side. Five From the front, the front. To, yep. The, yep. to the back. On like another favored bow tie brand that has <laughs> them the opposite but even different then, number one is on the driver's side front and it alternates <laughs> odd to even. So all the evens are on the passenger side, all the odds are on so the So they could get you in a lot of trouble treating a Ford like a Chevy. Yeah, there's two places it would bite you. First off, you potentially put the, you can see, you know, pistons have a, an orientation they have to be in because you want the intake relief to mm -hmm. match the intake valve <laughs> opposed the other way, which right. would work very well. 
And then again, you want to have those rods in the right order, in the right space. Otherwise, you could uh, you could get things messed up. And of course, then when you go to put the plug wires on, <laughs> that's, a, that's a whole other deal. <laughs> All learning right. learning experience. Uh-huh. Um, so here we're putting, the, we're ready for the, the timing gear. So timing gear slides on, I'll say like all the rest of them. But what this has that's different than, the Hemi would have had it, but we didn't use it. We mm -hmm. opted for some different ways of fueling it. But um, the cam, the big silver, looks like a pulley, quite honestly. That is, um, that's the eccentric for the push rod on the fuel pump. Okay. Or I should say the arm on the fuel pump on this, because your arm sticks in there a good six inches, it seems like. And then as that rotates, of course, it goes basically up and down on the mm -hmm. rod and, and gives you your, your pumping function. And again... More goop. More goop. And there's a swinger on there for the, for the uh, lower gear. That's what that last little piece is right here. There's an oil slinger, so it picks up oil in the bottom of the pan and slings it up onto the chain. Oh, that's cool. Um, and now you have a fairly large aluminum cover. That's your timing cover. It's a timing cover, water pump, fuel pump, pan, oil pan mount. I guess we'll use all the functions in there. All in one. And of course the crank seal too. So, um, yeah, crank seal went in there that was already installed. And then you have the harmonic balancer that has the, has the numbers on here. Those are beautiful from an aftermarket standpoint. I'd highly recommend and one of the reasons to actually change your, we didn't use the stock one for one particular reason, and that is harmonic balancers on a stock function always have, there's a, a steel band and a steel hub, and they're separated by a rubber band that's inside of it. It's a bonding agent and a, and a, and a rubber dampener. And those will crack, and then they'll lose their tension, and that outer band will start to slip. Hmm. Now, it's not so much the, it causes you two problems. One, as it turns or slips, your timing mark moves on you. So now <laughs> timing it gets to be different. And then, but the worst part is, is if they start to rattle inside themselves and shake the engine apart. Oh, okay. Because you can you get out of balance. <laughs> it's not point. harmonic anymore. It's not harmonic. <laughs> or harmonica. Yeah. Um, hey. Hey, look at Who's that, that guy? <laughs> and then you have, yeah, then you have your... This motor is, is intended for all kinds of accessories. Mm -hmm. It'll have a all banner. No power steering. <laughs> no air conditioning. Pure. All you need is an alternator to run this. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's all, that's all any engine ever needs. It <laughs> doesn't have to power all that super, no. superfluous stuff. No, that's right. Who needs power steering and air conditioning? If you want all that, take the bus, I guess. <laughs> Um, here's the, the oil pump going on because on this we had and mo lots of times we'll put the time obviously we'll put the timing cover on but we'll sometimes we'll have the pump on already in this mm -hmm. case we waited but because that you can see the timing cover completes the pan rail on this engine okay oh yeah you can see bolt, that right bolt, here the bolt side of it as much as the yeah exactly yeah. Um, so, so you have your um, you know your your oil pump, the actual gear part of it is right up here, and then your pickup tube here that goes into the uh, oil pan, that's the big sump section of it. All right, getting ready for the gasket here. Yep. And that's just what, clear silicone? Yeah, I'm using clear silicone here. Um, you could use black, orange, the whatever color you want to use, that's independent. What I like about the clear silicone is, is when it oozes out the sides, you, you don't see it. <laughs> so clear. It looks clean and crisp with that cork gasket hanging out there. So there were several comments of why on earth would you put a cork gasket in there? Oh yes. So uh, well, and there's always <laughs> also the why on earth are you putting silicone on a cork gasket? It's already a sealer. Well, it is, but it's not in the corners because there's a gap. And yes, is cork gasket my favorite? No, it's not. Um, a one-piece rubber is great if they're a precision gasket. Mm -hmm. Some of them are, some of them aren't. And then the other side of it is, you know, there's some of these that are um, like a multi-layer, um, kind of a rubber cork mixture. Those are probably the best because at the end of the day, the cork gaskets, they will dry out and they will crack and they will leak. I mean, that's what happens with cork. Um, fortunately, this, that's what was in the kit that we bought. 
is what it is. It'll be fine. And sometimes many, it's just an unavailability issue too, exactly. right? Exactly. Is yeah. Yeah. if someone is actually yeah. making one. Yeah, there's some. Yeah, some situations where they're not they're not made for. Them. Um, for this one, yes, we could have got a cork gasket or a, a rubber a rubberized gasket. And these have rubber to some extent, just not to that extent. Um, what's really tough to find is the self turning bolts because you have self tapping. You can mm -hmm. buy them all day long, but finding mm -hmm. these self turning ones is is exceptional if we could only find that for the rest of the of the engine then we, we wouldn't even have, well we wouldn't even need you anymore oh no we gotta have somebody to drink the coffee <laughs> um and i'll say that i took these original bolts and uh and actually plated them and, oh that's cool uh, so, so they, all these shiny so looks are, like brand new bolts are the original bolts they are the original bolts uh at least that were on the engine when we tore it apart uh -huh. um, there's always argument maybe that they're not the right bolts, but that's a whole other discussion. <laughs> they um, look right to me. But no, so yeah, we took the, I took these, um, I cleaned them up in a, a ultrasonic cleaner, got them very nice and clean from that aspect, and then put them in a, a, a like a tumbler, and little uh, stainless rods in there, and it tumbles it around and, and polishes them. Mm -hmm. And then um, and then there's a three, I'll call it a three-part, three-step uh, process for, for zinc plating. So, and if I happen to have access to it, thanks to a, a very good friend of mine and his restoration shop, uh, and we uh, we did those one late evening again. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but there's also if if you had you know where you wanted to do all these yourself as well, there's across the country there's plenty of plating companies. Find one on the web, you mm -hmm. know, locally, and they would charge you probably fifty bucks for that lot. You know, they're all going to be the same, so on and so forth. You take them in, and they'll they'll go through the process for you and do it. Cool. Which, after I spent the four hours doing it, fifty bucks would have been nice. <laughs> I would spend. Yeah. All right. So here the the, the heads are. One thing to to, to kind of scroll back. Um, you, unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to see it, but again, another one of those late nights cleanups that I my mind says I always have to do is I, I did a little polishing or porting work on the, call it the back side of the valve. So in the port fashion, so you have your, your valves that go into the, and cover it up. Mm -hmm. But when you have your seats in there, like we're showing, there's always a ridge in there because you're machining in to the casting mm -hmm. and then your seat is typically smaller than that hole or the ID of the counter bore. So I just take a, a die grinder and go inside there and clean that up just just to smooth it out i don't get crazy with the porting but it helps the flow about 30 percent real easily okay so that's just a simple performance thing to yeah. you're taking off any hard ridges exactly and yeah. that's just to increase and do you do that both exhaust and intake yes okay yeah so you're just you're smoothing the airflow yeah. in and out yeah exactly all right Looks like you get a uh, dig your little stand here. You like those pegs? Yeah, those work nice. That was you get them up off the ground and, and around the bench and not flip flopping them so much. And of course you can access, put the valves in right When, I, when I think of the, um, the Chevy small block and then also the, <laughs> the Hemi. The Hemi. Really nice. Yeah, it was, there was, yeah, the Hemi was all you could do for one person to lift one right. of those heads. Yep. Yeah, Santa was very good to us. For sure. <laughs> a couple extra toys. So um, back before we put on all these springs, and we'll, we can show just like the last two here. All right, so here you have, obviously these are all on, but you have a, the valve is hanging up out of here and there's a seal right here. Well then you're gonna see. So you, That's all these guys down yeah, here. Yeah, right down here. These are the seals by themselves. Of course the valve tips up here. But you see there's like some shims, well, exactly shims. <laughs> but so what happens here, so now in the order of assembly, right? Keep going back. Back? Yep. Oh. I mean, there's there five is. seconds in between. Yeah, that's what, right. That's oh, what, you're right, measuring right the, here. So we can probably find yeah. it in another shot. There you go. There back. we go. All right. So what my point is here is the springs need to be set at a certain height. They have an operating height. Um, these were at one inch 750, if I remember correctly. So what you end up having to do is, so you have your retainer and you have your spring, obviously, in the assembled fashion. And at this seat height, or where they're at right now, 
the seat or the valve is closed, you have a, a specific distance from there to there to, if you will, that compressed height of the spring. Mm -hmm. um, the unit here is just a micrometer that basically opens, gets longer, but it has a measuring device on it, so you can see what the number is. So what you do is you take a keeper and a retainer and you you assemble it 100% like you would over here, but instead of using the spring, you use that gauge. You can just tighten it up and you measure what that gauge is, and then you shim it accordingly. Um, you want to be, you know, if it calls out, um, you know, one inch 750, you want to be plus or minus five thousandths is, is what I shoot for. Obviously, nominal is the best, but if you happen to be a little bit over, a little bit under, it, it's fun. So you're just, you're using your um, calipers over here. Yeah, calipers, calipers to make sure my shims are the sizes they need to be. Gotcha. Okay. And I, and shims are, you know, I got them all through, through Thurlby's. They're, they're readily available through a, a machine shop function. All right. Oh, yeah. There's a good shot of you adjusting yeah, the yep. height there. Yep. Cool. But that, and again, all these type of deals, you can, you can slap them all together. You know, you can take any motor and just slap it together. That's not a problem. But when you, that blueprinting function that you hear a lot of, that's what this is. is just measuring it and put, and put it all the same. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, whatever the clearance needs to be, or in this case, the heights. But you put them all the same. Because then every cylinder is going to perform evenly, or at least a better chance to perform evenly. Mm -hmm. All right, so there's the head gasket going on because we've, it's such a shiny surface and the, and the head gasket really doesn't change color very <laughs> much. Because um, there was a question of whether we put a head gasket on it. Yes, we did. <laughs> yes. Um, a head gasket. One thing on this engine is it's very, um, and most of them are, but this one is specifically, the head gaskets are not, you can't flip them over because they're, they're not symmetric in, in okay. that fashion. So left has to go on the left, right has well, to go on the right. Well, it has to be right. up. They're oh, symmetric okay. right to left. They're not symmetric up and down, if that makes sense. Oh, yeah, yeah. On the head gasket. Gotcha. And then what's your little chart you're looking at there? Is that an order for? Yeah, so um, I give a dollar to anybody who remembers or still has theirs. So way back when, probably <laughs> in the 80s, God, that doesn't seem that long ago, but roughly in the 80s, in my subscription in high school, I got this in the mail. You, every year you would get something special in a plastic wrapper from Hot Rod Magazine. Mm -hmm. And that is what came in. And it's a beautiful little diagram of, of, I'll say, most of the engines. And it gives you just general torque specs. Mainly your, you know, this chart here is the, the torque sequence, which is very, very needed. You, yeah. have to, you, know, you, you want to torque everything down in the sequence that is involved. And, Take um, that, Google. Oh, yeah, exactly <laughs> right. Um, and, and that chart has never failed me. It's, it's, it's the best. That's awesome. That's fun having little stuff like that, yeah. especially when it harkens back to your like early days of oh, yeah. so being a car guy. Yeah, it's at least 20 years old. All right, so here, finally, are the threaded. Yep, so here's the threaded studs. Um, these went into the water jacket, so that's why we used uh, um, Teflon on them. Again, to seal it up, make sure it doesn't have any you know, leak. You don't want to leak up through the threads. Mm -hmm. And double nutting just to yep, because Yeah, double they're... nutting them, and, and you're not torquing the daylights out of them because you're not trying to pull the thread out because you are bottoming out. You could easily, I'll say easily, pull the thread up. But you want them, I want, you want them hand tight, but I use the double nut and the wrench because I get a better feel for hand tight. And on to the next one. Hey, look, there's another head gasket. Yep, another head gasket on. And the torque sequence. Yep. And more studs. A little more wipe down. Right. On the distributor. So there were a couple of little, <laughs> with, there were several people being like, why on earth would you put the old distributor in there <laughs> when you can just buy a new one or yep. do oh, some type of electric, um, so you know, computerize something or whatever. Exactly. Um, with this particular engine, we could have done a multitude. There's a lot of uh, other solutions. So yes, you could have done a, an electronic upgrade. Um, we stuck with the original points on this. We could also have done a dual point distributor, which one of the performance options 
uh, four four. It was a dual dual point. Oh, okay. Um, I look at it as kind of dual trouble <laughs> uh, as well, but that's that's maybe another discussion. But in uh, in myself as a as a car guy, I I see my responsibilities to use the parts already produced mm-hmm. if I can. If they're not junk, use them. And these are not junk. So yes, I took the extra time. Is it economically feasible, you know, one way or the other? Mm-hmm. Well, you can always argue that. I mean, depends what your time is worth. Yep. You know, in like, in our case, it's cool to see it get yeah. cleaned up and be used. Quite either. frankly, a lot of yeah, most people don't see how easy it is. I mean, I think I had an hour into cleaning that up. Mm-hmm. And what we'll see later is we took this time to do a how-to video of how to exactly. rebuild your yeah. distributor. So yeah. we we double dipped a little bit on our on our content and. Yeah. And yeah, it's one one less piece of junk that's going to yeah. a junkyard if you're if you're that type of person that cares about that thing, exactly. so, that sort of thing. Well, so. if you're a hot rodder, you already are because you're already not buying a brand new car. Right. <laughs> In general, pull the part, clean it all up, you know, inspect everything, and the, and grease and lube it, or yeah. lube it and put it back together. So here we're putting the solid lifters back in or in. And again, lubing them up and making sure they move freely in the bore and all that. And then push rods. Pew, 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 pew. More lube. (laughs) We were accused of A, not using solid lifters, which we did, and also not using rolling um, rockers. Well, we have, there's there's two versions of roller rockers. There's roller tips, which is what we're using. Uh And then there's full rollers. In a full roller, instead of having the kind of that half moon washer mm-hmm. at the bottom, the fulcrum piece, that would actually be a needle bearing and a, and a roller. Oh, okay. So, yes, we took some compromise. We didn't go to the full blown, full in roller okay. roller rocker. We used just so a wi- the tip. point where it actually rocks is a yeah, bearing. So, yeah. So here's the here's your roller tip, mm-hmm. and then here's your your um, this could be a roller going across that, and then okay. a needle bearing going across. Yep. We have the the like would be on a stock, and it would be a a, a roller folk or a, a just a fulcrum style. Now, is that something that was available? No. Then, and that was it sort would of have been the... available on the aftermarket, but it was not the stock function. In fact, stock rod, uh, stock push rods, even or um, stock rockers on the Cobras would have been just a stamped okay. or forged. You know, and, and so that was part of this build is we wanted to do more of a period appropriate as best build. As we, yeah, I mean, there's there's areas that make sense and there's areas that didn't. Okay. Um, one of the things that you do get into, um, and there would have been room, we could have done full rollers across here. There would have been enough space. Um, but those do get into some issues, especially when you're trying to put valve covers on them. You might mm. get too tall for the valve covers. Okay. Um, granted, the Holman Moody valve covers had plenty of room. So then this shot... Uh, while it appears as though there's not a lot going on, you're obviously rotating it because you see the rockers going. Yep. But what are you what are you doing here? So this is where you, and you would do this if it was hydraulic or not. You just this the setting is different. So what I'm doing here is I'm going through and setting the lash. And again, if it was a hydraulic cam, you would set the lash, but you take it to zero lash and then turn it, you know, a quarter to a half a turn more. Um, to, to push the plunger down. Okay. On a solid lifter, you bring it to, uh, let's say you bring it to zero, but then you back it off. Mm-hmm. And using a feeler gauge between the roller tip on the rocker and the top of the valve stem, and you set that clearance. And this one is, this camshaft called for 22 thousandths on intake and exhaust. That's not always the case. It can vary anywhere from 14 to 24. Um, okay. I've seen a, a, quite a few different ones. Depends on what the camshaft manufacturer wants. Um, in fact, if you back up right here, so right here, no, or, or looking at it today, I see one thing that we did wrong on this whole build <laughs> at this point in time. Mm-hmm. And that's right, in fact, I'm pointing to it right there. <laughs> so <laughs> the, the, the learning experience mm-hmm. is when when you're assembling certain engines and you buy um, the kit of freeze plugs, 
And when you have all the holes filled in this particular brand mm -hmm. that has a bow tie on it, you typically have extra plugs. And I have no idea why, but it's a generic kit that covers multitude of, right. of configurations. Yep. Right? So when I had an extra plug sitting on the table of putting all the freeze plugs and the oil gallery plugs, it was no, of no alarm to me that <laughs> I had an extra one, right? Completely blew it off because we did not pull all the plugs out. Right, we left you didn't out. have it in yeah. your mind of, I, I pulled this out, right. something needs to go back in. Exactly, so, and it was so gooped that when you look back at the engine block with all the goop in it from mm -hmm. years of abuse, you cannot see, clearly at least, <laughs> that there is a plug that goes right there now, what happens with that plug? The function of that plug is to seal off that passageway of the of the oil feed from the from the right to left standpoint of the lifters. So you get all kinds of oil going down this because your oil pump, remember, is up in here. So it fills all the way down this, right? But it doesn't create enough pressure to push that oil up. The, the push rods and then onto the rocker arm mm -hmm. and the springs and so on and so forth. And where you see that at is if that plug's not there when you're priming it, you don't get excessive amount of pressure like mm -hmm. 60 or 80. Right. You get, what do we have, 20? Yeah, 20 ish, yeah. So at that point it was like something's wrong. Uh oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so what is not shown, because we clearly. Put the intake manifold. Yep, on. ready. And, and one of go. our yep, one of our commenters <laughs> caught it. It's like, oh look, it's there. And somebody yep. can congrats to you. Yes. I forget yep. uh, what your name is, but yes, you caught it. Yep. We forgot to put that plug in. But we <laughs> we caught it immediately when it was on the test stand and we were priming it. So we were started priming it and we're like, oh we're missing something. <clears throat> All right, so last little bits of stuff here. Yeah, so we put in a uh, Fram AlterGuard filter, which meets and exceeds every one of the OEM specs. So <laughs> I know everybody has their brand preference. I have my brand preference on everything as mm -hmm. well. Um, this may or may not be my brand preference, but point is it's a perfectly good filter. We have some concerns as well as we have concerns with with all the parts and pieces that we use. And mm -hmm. I get it, that's, that's cool. And that's what's the beauty about this is everybody has their uh, preferences. Yeah, that is a huge so, fuel pump. That is the, <laughs> yes. When it came to the, they had extra time to design this fuel pump because they put a fill filter in the bottom of it, which is a fantastic idea. Um, opposed to having it along the line somewhere. Mm -hmm. you, you take it really from, you know, a couple added leak paths to only one because you you know, you can't lose, you don't have one spot to the ceiling. And, and then of course I had that real long arm that goes up in there. So you eliminate that, that canned um, piece eliminates a push rod, which mm -hmm. is a failure, potential failure one. Distributor. Yep, yeah, drop the distributor in. Of course, setting that in there and making sure the, you know, you wanna be, you wanna set, rough set the rotor to be at number one, firing mm -hmm. number one. And of course, fully engaged with your uh, oil pump push rod, it's, this one ha has a uh, hex in it, so you got two mating hexes that have to come together. Oh, Otherwise, it won't drop all the way down there, which is simple enough to take a, it happens to be a 5 16 hex, a long extension, just rotate a little bit until it drops straight down. Mm -hmm. um, and there we are, look at that. Those are some beautiful valve covers, by the way. They do look good. In putting clear coat on the intake and the uh, all the aluminum bits, Keep them nice and clean as well. <clears throat> Oil. Yep, some uh, GT Performance uh, Racing Oil from Pennzoil. And also we added extra cam break in lube. Right, per also, the... Per, per the cam manufacturer as well. And I don't remember if we showed or not again. We, we primed it and that's when we caught that it needed the... Oh yeah, that was... I think I, I think he showed it. I think it was in here somewhere. Is it? Yep, right there, there it is. There we go. Yep, so they were priming it. And, uh, and over yeah. over here, the engine stand, I yeah. was giving you the the oil pressure, and that's yeah. when we were like, oh, well, yeah. So we finished off the shot. 
And there's a break in the day. <laughs> in between this <laughs> shot and this shot, yeah. David pulled the uh, intake manifold yeah, off. Pulled and, the old switcheroo and put yeah, the plug in. Yeah. <coughs> Movie magic. Yes. Um, All right, plugs. Put in plugs. Of course, the, the seal there. And then you're... Uh, we hooked up some mufflers on this one instead of wide open headers. Thought that was a good idea. Still sound, sounded great. Yeah, it does. And these are a, <coughs> excuse me, a, uh, call it a factory tri y header. Mm -hmm. um, they are aftermarket built. They're not originals. Um, they're not the cast iron version, but they are a, a tubular version. All right, wires, air cleaner, ready to rumble. Fuel. Yep, put some fuel. <laughs> now, did you did you end up going with a I put in, higher octane? Yeah, I put in 93 octane to start with, and then that way it's always on a safe bet. And then as it once it's in the car and you're putting it under load and all that, because it's it's difficult to catch uh, spark knock, if you will, when you're doing it with no load on it. It'll spark knock under load, but not. Mm -hmm. Freewheeling, basically. Ah, oh, sounded good. So, so that's the first motor we've had on there that doesn't have solid mounts. And I was amazed at how much it rocked on that stand. It was fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can see the rubber yeah, yeah, rubber, rubber mounts right there. Mounts yeah. So there is it. That you got another one going. Yeah. Nice work. That was awesome. <laughs> it looks good. Yeah. It sounds good. It does. Lots of folks helped us out. Appreciate yes. that as always. Yes. I, the the quality of the parts are are amazing. You know today. Yep. So we're at five more cubes in that two eighty nine. <laughs> originally was and for thereabouts. Yep. And we're at. 20 to 25 percent more horse 20 i guess it'll be so we're roughly based on the the the, the parts that i put in it for another build mm -hmm. um that would be at about 310 horse cool and at pretty low i'll say low but it's about like 4500 rpm peak nice. as far as the 310 is concerned and then it carries through nice so that dyno sheet was was pretty and there's no reason to think that this would be any different I can't wait to slide it into a car, which who knows what that might be, <laughs> and uh, take it for, for a roast. It'll be fun. That would be. All right. Well, congrats on another successful build and uh, another, another couple months here. We'll have and another it, one for you guys. And again, thank you for all the amazing editing because, you know. Well, I, can't, I can take credit for all the shooting. <laughs> Thanks to Sandin, who edited this. Another one of our oh, video so guys here at Haggerty did an awesome job as uh, as usual uh, but yeah if you guys have any other questions about it feel free to leave those in the comments uh, and as always like subscribe share spread the word and we'll see you next time that's right take care see ya